Hi, and welcome to Words Apart. Hello. This week, Mim and I will be talking to Alice Proctor. Hi. Who is an art historian and a museum activist. Yes. And we're just going to be discussing one of, you know, she, she does many things, one of which you guys have probably <laughs> seen on Facebook. Um, it's the tours called The Exhibitionist. Yeah, so I run, I run a project called Uncomfortable Art Tours. Um, where I basically do unauthorised guided tours mm-hmm. at different national museums, at the moment only in London, but I am going to get out of London as soon as possible. <laughs> um, and I just uh, show up to museums and do guided tours, talking about colonial history and representations of imperialism and national identity and all of the stuff that the museum doesn't talk about. Mm. Um, yeah, Amazing. And what made you, when did you start um, doing these tours and how did you get in? So the first tours I ran were in summer 2017. Um, They actually first ran as part of the anti-university, which is the best thing ever. I love the people that organise the anti-uni. It's a sort of collaborative education festival where people can put out their own events and like talks and tours and that sort of thing, all around the idea of um, collaborative learning and de- institutionalizing educational spaces Mm. and things like that so I had this idea to do some guided tours talking about colonial history because it's so present in all of these museums and galleries it's it's everywhere but a lot of the people I would talk to about that a lot of my friends would say that they didn't really know where to start when it came to looking for these kind of stories um I'd been doing work like as a tour guide, as an educator in other museums. And so I sort of knew how to write a tour. And I put out, I sent an email to the anti-university being like, I got an idea. I don't know if it's going to work. Help me. Mm. And they were incredible. And so I, I ran these tours for the first time in this totally haphazard way. And they went really well. Um, not to brag, but... Yeah. No, no, they no, went no. really well. <laughs> people were super interested. Yeah. Was and it people... uni students that were mostly It was involved. uni students. A lot of people found me through the anti-uni. Um, but because I, I've i never like paid for advertising or anything, I've only people only ever find me um, through word of mouth and through Facebook and social media and stuff. And for whatever reason, the idea of the tours just seemed to immediately like kick off in this amazing way. And so there were a lot of people there that said, oh, yeah, you know, I work in museums or I'm interested in art. And then my friend saw this on Facebook and thought it might be fun, which was just the, the weirdest and wildest thing to show up and never have done, never having done one of these before and immediately have 20 people being like, yes, I want to come. And so, yeah, after the anti-uni, people were asking for different sites and more tours. And so I started... Um, writing scripts for a few other places and now I basically have ended up doing this as a full-time job which is not something I ever predicted (laughs) and not something I would recommend to anyone as a way of like finding your employment um don't don't do some free events on Facebook and see what happens that's not how you You should should do it because (laughs) you you end up being able to change people's kind of perspective exactly and it clearly just like tapped into something which I knew was growing so having worked in museums and studied art history I had so many friends and colleagues who would talk about sort of wanting to do more work on decolonizing museums thinking about these sort of things and last year is when we really started to see that all take off Mm -hmm. there was all of this amazing material coming out about like black lives matter in museums in particular um all these different galleries were especially starting to try and find ways of representing contemporary politics with their collections and so there was this huge push towards new contemporary collecting initiatives working with activist groups and that sort of thing and then i kind of popped up in the middle of that and was like well hey I don't do the contemporary stuff but I can give you the context so you can see what happened 200 years ago that laid the groundwork for where we are now and that worked Mm. and where did you start reading about all this context and how did you kind of start learning about that and educating yourself so I I'm Australian um and when I was growing up my parents like I grew up in the UK but my parents always made sure that I sort of felt uh, connected to the idea of being Australian, to understanding what that means as a white Australian. That means that my ancestors are 
involved in a very, very direct and tangible way with the process of um, the theft of land from Indigenous people, the dispossession of Indigenous people and the perpetration of genocide by the Australian government. Like, I was told as a kid, sort of the story is like, oh, my, my ancestors came and cleared the land, meaning of trees and of people. And so I had this really strong awareness of my own sort of place as part of this colonial legacy from a really young age. And then studying art history, wanted to look at that more and think about sort of the construction of identity in art, how people represent themselves. And that's in things that are kind of obvious, like costume, but also in um, racialization and representation of skin tones. But then there are all these little subtle things that come up in paintings or portraits as well, where someone will include like a little, uh, it'll be a book on a shelf or something that they're holding that refers to where they made their money. And you get all these really subtle hints at the histories of uh, enslavement and dispossession and violence, just in the sort of random domestic objects in the background of these portraits. And so I was already thinking a lot about that, um, wanting to study that further and doing my own research because none of my lecturers really knew how to help me. I spent a lot of time in the British Library. I spent a lot of time reading like 18th and early 19th century newspapers and stuff for a while because that was really useful. Um, but mostly, you know that thing where you sort of read an article and it's really interesting and then you go and look up all the footnotes and you just keep going from there. Like I found on one or two things and just went down these enormous rabbit holes. <laughs> but when I start, when I develop each tour, I always start in the gallery. So I'll walk around and see what's there and see what sort of jumps out as something that I could possibly talk about. And then we'll go away and research sort of the characters in the paintings in greater depth. But it's really, it's really simple, you know, to be in a gallery and think, I wonder who this person was and just sort of look them up and see, oh yeah, he was an official in the East India Company or, you know, his uh, uncle was involved in um, the slave trade or he was an MP for Liverpool that fought against abolition. That sort of, that sort of thing pops up really, really quickly. And then from there, you just have to decide how you're going to tell the story and what mm -hmm. you're going to use yeah. to work with it. Do you feel... So when you do these tours, this is obviously not what the museums are portraying. Is it something you want them to be able to just have in the museums one day? Or do you think it's... I, I want museums to be better. Yeah. And so I just really wish that more of these galleries felt kind of confident in talking about this history yeah a lot of people have responded to some of the stuff that I say on like Twitter and things like that by saying you know well there's no such there's you can't be perfect so you may as well not even try and it's like that's exactly like that's that's no mm. there's a difference between like having no gallery text at all and having a racist wall label <laughs> and there are plenty yeah. of points along the way where you can include a story but it doesn't have to be the racist mm, one kind completely. of thing and so people tend to take this quite extreme sort of approach to how we tell stories in museums what i'm trying to do is bring in a little bit more nuance mm -hmm. but also make space to say like historical figures weren't perfect. I think that's something that we should be able to sort of take for granted. Mm, yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, that's so basic, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, it is. No one, mm -hmm. no one was flawless. People did things that may now be treated as great heroic acts, but the reasonings behind them may not have been great, or they may have caused a huge amount of harm at the time and ongoing harm mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And so what I want to do with the tours is give people the kind of the skill set and the toolkit that they can then go into these galleries on their own and see some of these stories for themselves because the museums aren't necessarily going to provide it. That's yeah. not in a kind of like big conspiracy mm -hmm. way, but it is in just the mm -hmm. fact that these spaces have a narrative that they're following. They can't tell every story, but the ones that they've chosen to tell are often incomplete um, and very selective. Definitely. And what do you think, so obviously, you know, you've got background in history of art and mm. you've been doing this for a long time. Um, what about if there was a young person who didn't go that much to museums? Yeah. What would be like the sort of one piece of information mm. you would say to them to just kind of understand what your research is about or even just like one fact that you've learned oh, while gosh. doing this that has been like something which really stuck with you and kind of like pushed you to do it? First of all, I would say like museums are 
often um, institutions that sort of enshrine and perpetrate huge amounts of historical violence and contemporary violence. There's been a lot of research uh, going on lately about profiling in museums and the fact that some people will have their bags searched more thoroughly than others, obviously. Right, yeah. Um, and, you know, people will describe being followed by security guards if they if they, they think that they're being treated as unwelcome in those spaces and that sort of thing. And there is a huge amount of um, institutional racism in these spaces as well. So not to then go and say, like, but seriously, go to museums. Mm. But it is a really important thing to visit some of these objects and to see these pieces because yeah. if you can go into these spaces and you feel safe in them like don't push yourself to not feel safe but if you can go because your presence in those spaces is a really important action visiting any art gallery is a performance mm. because everyone around you is kind of watching you look at the art that sort of thing but you can choose how you participate in that so you can go into a gallery somewhere like the british museum and you can read the text on the walls but you can also bring your own interpretation and see these spaces as constructed right because yeah. someone has chosen what objects to collect someone has chosen mm. how to display those objects and someone has written the text in these galleries and you can bring your own perspective to that as well. You know, if you see something and you know that the story that's being told is incomplete or incorrect, your presence there and the fact that you can then pass that on to people around you is so important. Mm. Um, so if you feel safe and able to go to museums, that's the most important thing. And art galleries as well. Look at the representations, look who's included and not included. Yeah. ask questions about where the money comes from that sort of thing be kind to the gallery staff obviously <laughs> because in the overwhelming majority of cases the people that actually do the frontline work in museums are seriously underpaid or not paid at all and mm. yes there's so many there's places so many, which just have volunteers the volunteer right? the victoria and albert museum mm -hmm. entire front of house staff is volunteers wow um a lot of other galleries like the national gallery uh pretty much laid off all their staff about five years ago and now hire an external security company to do the gallery and vigilation, things like that. Oh. They've just laid off a bunch. Well, they've got a bunch of, um, they've got a bunch of their educational staff yeah. that are uh, protesting at the moment because despite the fact that most of them basically work full time at the gallery, they're still being uh, classed as freelancers. I've seen to them. avoid. Yeah. 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 So it's uh, 27 members of staff from the national gallery are protesting against these kind of yeah. really exploitative contracts mm -hmm. that they're on. Mm -hmm. Staff at the Greenwich Museums went on strike this time last year because they were being paid less than a living wage uh, oh. because of the way that their breaks were counted, that sort of thing. Right. Be kind to gallery staff yeah. is what I'm trying to say here because <laughs> yeah. they're going through so much <laughs> shit behind the scenes yeah. Yeah, yeah. and they are not the ones that are responsible for the stories exactly. being told in those That's spaces. But having said that, go and ask questions. Be empathetic, but also don't be afraid to push it. Like, mm -hmm. if you see something that feels really wrong, tell people about that. Tell your friends. Mm -hmm. Go back to the gallery. Do more research. Try and find out what's going on there. The, the most important thing that you can look for is the dodgy provenance of objects as well. That's an immediate giveaway mm -hmm. a lot of the time. So um, the repatriation discussion that's going on at the moment about the Moai statue in the British Museum... It's from Easter Island, Rapa Nui, and community members have asked for it back. This is really very yeah, much in the news cool. right now. The gallery text next to that figure says, gives no information about how the British got hold of it in the first place, but has this one cute little line about how it was donated to the museum by Queen no. Victoria. <laughs> and how, how did they actually? Uh, so there was a British captain who was stationed on the island who took it despite like vocal protest from uh, mm, the people yeah. on Rapa Nui at the time that like you can't you can't just take this and he's like too bad <laughs> sucks for you <laughs> and pisses <laughs> off back to England with this massive statue so bad. and gives it to Queen Victoria as a gift she's like what am I supposed to do with this mm. and gives it to the British Museum and then that's what they take and then that's what they refer to so it's not a lie yeah. to say it was donated to the British Museum by Queen Victoria but it's kind of a sin of omission yeah. to then not go on and say like she got hold of it because, because of yeah. this other situation. Yeah. 
And that's really common with a lot of yeah, a lot do you, of pieces. Do you talk a lot about that within your tools, kind of this yeah. idea of stolen art and Yeah. So we also talk about things like the Benin Bronzes, which is another repatriation story that's very kind of present right now. And the fact that they were taken as part of the destruction of the city of Benin in a military expedition by the British, uh, for really no good reason. Um, it was a punitive expedition because the British wanted to create a sort of imperial stronghold mm. in in the region, and mm. they decided that the city of Benin had been holding out against them for too long. So they destroy the city, they destroy the palaces and the temples and all the shrines and all of the kind of incredible architecture of Benin, and then sell off everything that they've taken from the city to cover the costs of the expedition and to pay the wages of the soldiers that do the destroying, mm. which is really, really wow. common. Mm. So that's how these pieces end up in the museums a lot of the time, is that the the army will kind of confiscate art to cover its costs. And it's often referred to in these very euphemistic terms. Mm. And then they'll auction them off to be bought by private collectors or to be bought by um, by the museums. So this happens all the time like the destruction of the old summer palace in china in the 1860s by the french and british armies they spent three days like burning the the palace down and destroying it as thoroughly as they possibly can so there's Mm. basically no architectural remains but there are a few smaller objects which for the most part soldiers just kind of pocket and and take with them as souvenirs but also some of those are then sold at auction in order to kind of make up for the wages of these soldiers. And so there are these cups, these kind of beautiful enamel cups that were part of a a sacred ceremony, a really important kind of imperial ritual that end up in the Wallace collection in Mayfair because Henry Wallace buys them like 40 years later, knowing full well that they had been looted. But he's like, well, how else am I going to get my hands on these incredible Chinese uh, goblets? So that happens all the time. And why do you think that museums aren't telling the full story? Like, what is it? Museums are really scared of repatriation. If you look at galleries like the British Museum or the v in particular, and they're the two that really come up again and again as mm-hmm. the big names for this, they are terrified that if they open their doors and let one piece out, everything will go. And, like, this is a... This is a really messy situation because they also have no sort of system built into their structures allowing for the repatriation of objects. You know, these are museums that are founded in the 18th century or in the mid-19th century in the case of the V&A. And they don't they don't ever plan to give anything back because at the times that they're created, that's just not even on anyone's radar. Mm. And so there's no protocols. There's no kind of like precedent to follow. And so instead of making one, for a really long time, a lot of these governing bodies have been kind of hiding behind the fact that, like, well, it wasn't written in from the beginning. So we don't have to do it now, right? It's like, it doesn't work like that anymore. It's been 200 odd years. Get your shit together. Yeah, no, definitely. I agree. I think yeah, it's just so. Have to, like, you speak to the people who run the museums about this and what they all say, like, what, have they, what do they say about it or... It's it's really hard because the tours that I do are unofficial. Yeah. So you don't have much communication with Not really. Yeah. When I do communicate <laughs> with people, it tends to be on an individual basis. Mm. And I know people that work in these galleries, I know people that work as curators in spaces like this. Um, but the problem is that they can't speak for the institution. Mm. You know, when you talk about the British Museum you're talking about the hundreds, if not thousands, of staff there. Like, that's everybody who works there. Yeah. Plus all the governing bodies, plus the people that actually, like, give the sponsorship and pay the checks and BP and mm. people like that are involved there. Mm. So yeah. so there's so it's so much more than just... It's not like a room full of people playing with objects and choosing yeah, what goes on the wall. It's much more complex. It's so messy. Yeah. And because I'm unofficial as well, and that's something that, like... Is, is actually really important to me that I don't work for these spaces and so I get to sort of write my own narratives. Yeah. But it does mean that I have a kind of like, I don't have the sort of way in yeah. that a lot of other people might have. It's, it's, it's tricky. Yeah.
one of the things that what I think personally with your like branding on Facebook oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought is actually one of the reasons why I think it's really really good thank you and I think it's you know you see it on it's very, it's very striking yeah, and I know, it really is. Um, I know it's something quite small but I think even your website and things like that I think for other young people who want to you know get out and start doing these things like how did you get about doing you know making yeah. it so so impactful? so all of all of the design like the posters the badges that yeah. say display it like you stole it everything was designed by my little brother no way because <laughs> that's brilliant that's so good because i am a i am a mean big sister who makes <laughs> him do stuff for me how um, old is he he's 20 he's an amazing artist yeah. Um, his name's George. Um, he always Amazing gets very George. sad when people don't credit his art if they use it for stories. <laughs> um, but he mm. uh, he did all the posters for me. Wow. Wow. And so I had this idea of like, we need to find a way of representing mm-hmm. this. Yeah. When I was first developing the tours, he was pretty much the first person I spoke to about this to be like, I don't know how to do this. And he was a bit like... I don't know what you're trying to do, but um, (laughs) fine. And so he did this incredible digital drawing of the National Gallery in ruins, like Trafalgar Square, but kind of crumbling and falling apart. And it was stunning and exactly what I wanted to kind of evoke with that. Then as the tours grew, I was like, it's not really working anymore. I don't just do the National Gallery now. Yeah, We need to find something different. And so we came up with the idea of using these sort of historical characters right. with the slogans written across them. Mm. And I was like, I don't know how to do this at all. And he was like, it's fine. It's, like, <laughs> it's not like I was going to do my coursework anyway. <laughs> it, just did, it just knocked these up for yeah. me really, really quickly. Wow. Like, well, we'll see how it looks, right? And they were perfect yeah they're great they're amazing but those posters were maybe I don't know he might have been lying to me about how long it took him but as far as I'm aware that was like two hours work wow to just be like well we'll find some images and we'll do this um and he designed the stickers and the badges and everything when I came up with the postcard the dear art gallery like your label is racist kind of thing I literally like scribbled it out on this random scrap of paper sent him a photo and was like, could you make this look nice? Mm-hmm. And half an hour later, he was like, it's done, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> he he goes Incredible. through so much for me. <laughs> no, it's um, amazing. It's so good. But all, of, but what so I'm funny. trying to get at here is that <laughs> all of the ideas I've had with the tours, with all the design stuff, I've been really lucky that I've had people to bounce it off. Right. Yeah. And so I've got friends that work in heritage, but also work in other sectors, like in publishing or in um, edit- like editors and other writers and really creative people. And so I'd basically be in the group chat like, I think I want to do these tours and I don't know how to do it. And someone would pop up and be like, you want people to come to an art gallery with you and get really uncomfortable. I'm like, <laughs> yes, that's it. That's what we're calling it. <laughs> so having, yeah. having people around me that didn't necessarily have an art historical background and didn't necessarily like work in the same areas as me, but were willing to be like, you're going somewhere. I'm just going to watch it happen. And also cheer from the sidelines has been the most incredible thing. (laughs) And when everything got really nasty, when, when the press attention hit earlier this year, and I was getting, like, I found out that the Daily Mail had written an article about me because I woke up, I turned my phone on, and the first thing I saw was an email from a total stranger telling me to kill myself. What? So so there was this really, like, intense backlash, and it's nothing compared to what some people get. Yeah. yeah. But I was still, like... I don't, but, at this point, this came out of absolutely nowhere. Like, it was less than a week between me getting a call from some journalist being like, yeah, I just want to, you know, I heard you're running these tours, we're writing another story, I just wanted to check out what this is about, to them publishing a story about me, to then, like, the Daily Mail yeah. and other... Um, and papers what picking was, up what on was it. What the negativity? Uh, what would they? Oh, you know, so and so, like this little upstart brat, <laughs> thinks that mm. she can tell us about history, kind of thing. And it was very much like, oh well, she's a young woman from Australia, so what would she know? And it's like, <laughs> oh. but do you think Mate. it's also, also because you are making them uncomfortable? Absolutely, yes. and that's the thing. Yeah, is that's that, like, so well, it's working, right? Yeah, so you um, are doing what. No, exactly. for sure, exactly. for sure. And then the whole kind of response was this very like, how dare you tell mm. me that Queen Victoria wasn't the best? Yeah. You know, how dare you say mean things about Elizabeth I? <laughs> and it's like, oh, come on, really? 
But I had this really, really intensive, nasty response. And it was extremely hard for me because I came out of absolutely nowhere. And my friends just locked me out of my Twitter account, locked me out of social media for a couple of days. And were like, you're not going on the internet until we've gone through and like reported and blocked Mm. every single one of these bastards in your mentions telling you that you deserve to die because you don't need to see that. Yeah. And that it was honestly like not exaggerating when I say it pretty much like saved, saved me in many ways from the brutality of that. So having that kind of community, great support network, an amazing support network. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, don't, don't do anything public unless you have a really solid, gang of friends behind you because mm. otherwise it will just be and horrific. I guess like with the work you do that's the reaction people get is like when people hear what they don't want to hear they automatically yeah, become exactly. defensive yes it yes. is it, 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 yeah. it's like I d- it's quite a normal like thing a reaction for people to have I think yeah. in all senses absolutely yeah, and definitely. it's also like if I'm coming in and telling someone, you know, everything you learned in history class was a lie, yeah. people get very defensive. And I understand that, you know, I've been that person in the past where it's like, what do you mean? You know, mm. the Anzac soldiers weren't heroes at Gallipoli. <laughs> it's like, this, you know, you get all these kind of myths yeah. and yeah. these foundation stories that you pin yourself to. And this is something that I think everyone has experienced in some form or another. Like you have sort of the historical figures that you really latch onto. Mm-hmm. A lot of people get really upset when I say mean things about Elizabeth I. So mm. Elizabeth I is one of those characters that, like, in history classrooms, if you're a girl with even a little bit of personality, you'll probably latch on to her because she's one of the only female yeah, can... figures that ever comes up. And so she's yeah. often constructed as this kind of proto-feminist hero. Right. And... I don't know, like, I definitely read books about her when I was a kid and was like, yay, the Tudors, it's the best. And it got me really (laughs) into history. Yeah, Yeah, same, I love the Tudors. (laughs) And then you're doing a tour and you say, so Elizabeth I uh, funded the first British slave trading voyage. And everyone goes, oh, no. (laughs) And, like, you can see people's faces fall because they're like, the one person I wanted to idolise. You can't. Yeah. And yeah. you can't. And, and yeah. it's true with all of these characters. And it's like, I feel a little bit bad for bursting people's bubble sometimes, but also don't have heroes because yeah. they'll always disappoint you. <laughs> and I mean, like, it's it's <laughs> it's weird to think of it. And even in time now, it's like we don't. Uh, idolize um, anyone in our government or oh my God, the monarchy. Can you yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, <so> true. <laughs> if I met someone who idolized anyone currently in government, <laughs> yeah. I, I would no. never speak to them again. <laughs> that is not a thing. But I mean, no. you do get it, I guess, now with like uh, you know Meghan Markle. You do get it in the oh. same way. Yeah. But we're gonna find out probably. And oh yeah, yeah. I know. I mean, yeah. That's just, do you know what I mean? Like even Kate. You know, everyone. But the worst is, is when people might look back, it might even still be the same thing. And people will look back and think that, you know, that these were these perfect, like, feminist Right, exactly. Heroes, but, but also, like, down with the monarchy and anyone who voluntarily <laughs> marries into the monarchy yeah. is not the feminist hero that you think they are. Exactly. That should be one of the, one of the main points when people it's think so about her. It's like, God, she's so different and she's, like... So you creative know, and yeah, diverse. she's doing for so our like, country. Yeah, but she's also still voluntarily participating yeah, in, in an that. archaic institution yeah so i have some questions about her credentials um no and it, it's funny because people do latch onto these characters and like people want to find someone that they can relate to and i get that because i've done that too we all do that i still yeah. find that there are some historical figures where i'm like i just really want to love mm. them yeah and it's always really hard mm. And sometimes there's a little bit of the, like, separate the art from the artist kind of dilemma where you have to be like, well, he made great paintings, but also was probably really, really racist. But it was the 18th Mm -hmm. century. So how do I reconcile this? And mostly you have to sit with the fact that it makes you uncomfortable and think about what you are invested in when you want someone to be perfect, Mm. right? When you want your favorite artist or your kind of favorite historical figure to be flawless, you know that's never going to be the case. So you have to kind of work through this weird sort of psychological landscape of like, why do I want to idolize someone who's been dead for 300 years? Yeah. And it's a weird space to be in. Yes. And it's somewhere that I've spent a lot of time. Yeah. (laughs) But but yeah, it's it's really tricky. Yeah, no, definitely. It's kind of something quite weird to to think about in that way but I think it's it, also for so many young girls I think in school it was so hard to actually think of 
to, to be in class and actually have someone to idealize. There's no one. Yeah, well, That's there, the thing, I, I, there's I can't no one. think of anyone that I ever really did growing up. We did Boudicca. Yeah. We did Boudicca. Sure. Yeah, that's right. probably the only and that's, one. That's the thing is that you get maybe anything. like one or two figures mm. and so you cling to them. Yeah. And you you want them to mean a lot to you. I was I was super into the Tudors and so that was kind of my thing. Mm-hmm. I was quite into the Victorians for a while but I never really like adored Victoria in the same way because even 10 year old me had some kind of like standards and taste when it came to my <laughs> historical figures. Um, and Victoria was just... A, disaster on so many levels um but i you know i remember one of my friends being really like obsessed with florence nightingale and things like that and she wanted to be a nurse and she loved florence nightingale and it's like or she was she was really racist she was a little bit into eugenics um she was not not flawless uh, spent most of her time as far away from the front lines as she could possibly be while taking mm-hmm. a lot of credit and was able to become a nurse because she had a family that would bankroll her. Right. She's simultaneously yeah, homophobic and some people think actually uh, queer. So there's a really interesting kind of personal dilemma going on there as well and her history is fascinating. Mm-hmm. But she's not the person that you want to be when you grow up, you right. know, for yeah. so many reasons. Mm. Like the Florence Nightingale Society organized this massive kind of backlash when the Mary Seacole statue was announced a few years ago. No way. I don't know if you, no. do you know the statue? There's this yeah, beautiful yeah, statue to Mary Seacole um, that was only put up a few years ago. And the Florence Nightingale Society got really shitty that it was like, someone's taking attention away from our Flossie and it's no. not fair. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It was, it was so, ridiculous. it was such an extreme version yeah, of that right. kind of like, you want, it to be all about this this historical figure that you've just clung on to mm. who probably would have hated you like she was a mean person by yeah, all yeah, accounts yeah. she <laughs> she seems to have pretty much hated everybody mm. um so half of you she probably wouldn't have even liked why are you so invested mm. in this random dead person yeah it's so true it's so true it's so fascinating yeah. to me because I think I think we just seek to you're right we just want to have someone to relate to and to be like I want to be like this yes. person and that's a completely yeah. like understandable process and of, honestly like we all do that you know that yeah. I'm not being judgmental of people for doing that because it's a really important kind of process of growing up and maturing and finding the people that you do admire but you have to balance that admiration yeah and that's that's the trickiest mm. thing is that it can't be just like blind adoration. You have to find have to find a way of seeing them simultaneously as someone to admire, but also as a person with all of the flaws and all yeah. of the bad shit that comes with that. And I guess in the same way, learning to be critical of things, and in in, in the same way as critical of yeah, people like we're idolizing. Not really taught to be critical at all, in and yeah. especially of art. I think when you go into a yeah. museum, it's like this is this amazing painting this is you know you never get taught to be like hey, how can how can we look at this a bit more no and that's yeah that's, that's something that I'm trying to kind of help people develop with the yeah. tours as well because it's like you don't people don't even really get taught sort of skills of literary criticism mm-hmm. but at least people are more familiar with the idea of saying like well here is a poem and here are the techniques and like what is the atmosphere that the writer is trying to create yeah. here and even on a very basic level you know that's an engagement in criticism and a kind of learning to read on different levels yeah so you can do that with a painting as well obviously Mm -hmm. it's all about the different elements and how they're put together you look at the framing of the figures kind of their positions in terms of scale proximity um their gesture and sort of the power relations between different characters that will pop up in these scenes and recognize that that is all the artist kind of working to create a narrative right it's it's writing a text it just happens to be a visual thing rather than a written medium but you can treat paintings and artworks and objects of all kinds and I'm talking about painting in a kind of like very western European sense here but you can read that and you can see the way that these stories are being constructed but also the environment around those objects as guiding the story so how is it presented within the gallery space you know does that mean that you look at it face on or that it kind of sneaks up on you? Is it spotlit? Is it in a case with lots of other things? Is it behind glass or not? Is it out in the open? Can you walk the whole way around it? They're all elements that inform your interaction with this object and with the story of it. Especially with portraits, what you're seeing is a conversation between the artist and the subject 
where the subject says, this is how I want to be seen. Mm -hmm. And the artist goes, well, I'll do my best. Mm -hmm. And there's this element of translation there. And then that's being kind of spoken over by the gallery and you as the viewer have to come in and try and see all of these different perspectives simultaneously. And it's hard work and it takes practice, but it's not as scary as some people seem to think it is. And it shouldn't be scary and it shouldn't be daunting because in the same way that you can look at a picture and be like, well, I know that's an advert, you know? Yeah. It's the same process with a painting yeah. to then be like, well, this is clearly putting forward a specific agenda. Yeah. You have these kind of critical visual skills, but a lot of like the, the same skills that you use to analyze a painting are the ones that you use to watch like a TV drama where you're following the different characters and looking at the atmospheres around them and that sort of thing. It's all so present in everything that we do, but there's this real narrative about like art must not be questioned and mm, art yes, as this sort of elite true. sport where no one gets to play. A hundred percent. Unless yeah. unless you've passed all these hurdles. And that's not the case at all. With the tours as well, I'm trying to use my privilege. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I can go into these museums and galleries and be like, nice white girl with an art history degree who looks like every other <laughs> tour guide. Mm -hmm. And I get away with a lot because they think I'm, I'm bringing a university class. They don't expect you they to don't... actually be exactly. deconstructing And I'm everything. using that profiling to try and sort of subvert. Yeah. The, I have an umbrella of privilege and people can kind of come under it with me and I can like sneak yeah. them into this incredibly institutional like hierarchical space yeah to try and break that down mm -hmm. and work from within yeah so i try and be really conscious of my own sort of positionality in this and a lot of what i think about and work with are conversations that i'm able to have because i have this privilege that lets me into mm -hmm. museum spaces like i feel very at home in an art gallery yeah and that's not the case for everyone that's not the case for the vast majority of people but hopefully what I can do is if people do want to come on a tour with me, I can say like, well, you don't have to feel unwelcome here mm -hmm. because this space should welcome you. And the fact that it isn't welcoming you isn't a problem with you. It's a problem with the space. So how can we be conscious of that and kind of work through it? I've always wanted this to be bigger than me. Like yeah. this is not in any way, shape or form a vanity project. Yeah. Um, I want to do more tours. I want to get out of London and be around the country. The thing that I'm really, really hoping to do in the new year is work with more um, school kids. So mm, high yeah, school groups, like GCSE age teens who are the most incredible like age demographic for thinking about difficult questions because yeah. they just go for it and it's amazing yeah. but it's also <laughs> such a formative time for finding your identity yeah that i really want to work with more um youth groups and young people's programs mm. to help kids find a way into these spaces and to work with the kind of stories that you can tell yeah there. yeah well i wish i had <laughs> like I, yeah. I wish i had like people telling me things that weren't what we were fed in education, like things that made us feel uncomfortable. Cause I right. feel like I, I did, so I did a access course um, last year mm. and one of my um, uh, subjects was African and Caribbean studies. Right. And that was for the first time in my life. Like I was kind of um, being given this information that was uh, like, com like completely denied in all of education yeah. and I was uncomfortable for like nine months sitting in that class <laughs> that's and I, great yeah and it was the most it was the most like and like it was just the most amazing mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. I've ever had within education yes. and I've never learned so much by being so uncomfortable and it's like if that was given to young people and they started to feel this at younger ages yeah. like so something like that what that's, you so that's, do is that's a that's for a sure. kind of big project mm. that i'm really pushing for yeah in the next next few months next year um i'm doing more writing i'm gonna do more tours in london and starting in january i'll be doing public tours again but uh at the moment i'm taking a little bit of time off because yeah. i'm just very tired <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine i mean you, you're doing uh, yeah. so much yeah. i mean it's amazing so, so thank guess, you. Thank yeah, you thank for you having me. No, so like, thank if you, you want to find out more about the tours, yeah. um, yes. my website is theexhibitionist.org and you can find me there or look up Uncomfortable Art Tours. Uh, I'm on Twitter all the time, <laughs> screaming about stuff and often picking fights with museums. Woo. Um, so <laughs> if you're up for that, if you're up for seeing me like 
get in an argument Jeez. with some random curator my twitter is a a proctor which is p-r-o-c-t-e-r <laughs> proctor with an you e heard it here. <laughs> um, yeah. people spell my name wrong it's really petty but like you have to find me on the internet because some poor chick called alice proctor with an o was getting all these messages for a while oh, and i feel really really bad for her she's like wow so, what am i doing in my life <laughs> so please um please don't don't yeah. <laughs> we'll put a link and everything on on this anyway yeah, at the yeah, bottom. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Thank don't worry. Thank you so much for having me. No yeah, worries. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>